Hello and welcome to another episode of The Lowdown. Today I am absolutely thrilled to be joined by the host of Blue Moon Podcast and co-host of The Athletics, Why Always Us, David Mooney, to discuss all things Manchester City. David, welcome to the show. Hi, Connor, how you doing? All good. David, it must feel great to be a Manchester City fan at the moment with all this talk <laughs> of the quadruple on the cards. Uh, yeah, let's not get too ahead of ourselves on that one. Um, it, it comes around at this point where, where City is still in the League Cup at this point of the season. It always comes around, wow, well, they're still in all four competitions, still going all four for, for all four competitions. And it was like that was still being said of the season where Manuel Pellegrini finished fourth. Like, like City are always going for all four competitions. Uh, and as yet, there's a reason why nobody's ever done it because you know it's really hard to do. Um, so let's let's not get too ahead of ourselves. That they're they're in a very good position um, in the cup competitions, and they're probably going to go on to win the the, the Premier League at this stage. Um, the Champions League is the one where you know anything can happen at this stage. So if they if they were to walk away with the Premier League and a trophy, uh, I think they've had a good season. If they were to walk away with the Premier League and the two domestic trophies, they've had a very very good season. Uh, and if they were to get all four, then I think they've probably had the best season we've ever seen. <laughs> so uh, that's that's kind of where I'm at with it. Let's let's not get too uh, feet on the ground sort of thing. <laughs> and you speak about feet on the ground and humbling beginning, so to speak, Dave. Where did this love for Manchester City originate, Bruno? Um, I don't really know uh, properly. I've I've told that many lies about how I started becoming a City fan. I don't. I can't really remember what's true anymore. Uh, my mum and dad are City fans, so it's 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 coming from them, obviously. Um, I I can't remember if my first game was a nil nil draw against Southampton or a one nil loss against Leicester at Main Road. Uh, what I do know is the first time City scored while I was at Main Road, uh, I was about five or six years old, um, and I didn't know why. I, I didn't know why everybody suddenly jumped up, and so I dived under the seats. I was terrified of, of the noise. Um, I remember wearing a black bin liner uh, in the main stand because it was absolutely teeming down for one game, and the woman in front just said, "Hey, put this on," and she handed me a black bin bag, and so I, I wore that for the game. Um, and it all kind of, it, it kind of grew around that time uh, my best mate in school will was a massive city fan um and so i think that combined with the fact that my mum and dad were were city fans were was probably kind of where it all started um i do know that going to main road it was it was more my mum taking me to main road than my dad because my dad uh, my dad was playing football um not to not to a, a great standard he was never semi pro never semi pro or pro, pro or anything like that um, but it was a decent level of amateur football, which meant he was usually playing at three o'clock on a Saturday. Um, so he was usually not available to take me to Main Road. And it was kind of it was kind of mum's impetus that that ended up when he finished football. Uh, we ended up getting season tickets and it was in 97, 98 when we got our first season ticket. And they went they either went up or down at the end of every season up until 2003. So I did, when I got my season ticket, I didn't see them play in the same division in consecutive seasons for about six years. Um, and so kind of it, it was it, it was always really exciting because they were either going up or down at the end of the season. I thought, oh, it must be great for this, this football lock. And then you get the mid noughties where nothing happens. And you kind of go, well, is this what it is? This what it is? You get to 40 points and just sit there in the league. Is that how it works? Um, and all that from from being in a in a push chair at the side of a football pitch on Mellon's playing fields, listening to my dad celebrate because City had just put five past United in 1989. So it's 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 a, it was kind of a slow burner, I think, uh, me and City. But it's it's got to the point now where um, I think there's... I know my partner gets frustrated because there's not an hour of the day I don't think about something related to City. There's like you, could, I don't think you could time an, an hour block where I have not had an idea or a thought about something to do with City in that time. Um, and uh, I make no apologies for that. <laughs> and you speak about going to Main Road back in the day as a five, six-year-old wearing a bloody bin liner. To <laughs> what similarities are there, Dev, between that club back in the day in the mid-90s compared to where they are now at the city of Manchester Stadium? Completely different ownership, completely different, I suppose, fortunes over the years. Is it really... As a fan, is it, can you separate Manchester City before 2008 and Manchester City afterwards? 
Yeah, this is a this is a common question, and the, the problem that I have with this with the way kind of outsiders look at that, and I, I fully understand why, because like the club has changed so much from an outside perspective, but from an inside perspective, it's it's still very much the same, and it still feels the same when you when you go there and, and whatnot. I mean, let's be honest. I grew up. Um, I grew up in the latter stages of Main Road. I don't remember, for instance, uh, the Kipax being a, a, an all-standing um, uh, stand. Uh, I, I only remember it as all-seater, and there's a lot of City fans who will remember that as, as the place to go and stand and, and, and watch the watch the football. Um, so I my kind of experience of Main Road is, is of the latter era, um, but I still love that place, and I still... If I had to make a decision over whether I wanted to watch City play at the Etihad or at Main Road, I would pick Main Road because it's it's still it's still the ground that I fell in love with the the kind of like the sights, the smells, the fact that it it it, it didn't look symmetrical and it didn't look right because everything was was kind of hodgepodge of four different stands. Um, that isn't to say that the Etihad is not a great stadium. It's a it's a wonderful stadium, and I would go as far to say that probably currently the best in the Premier League as well. Um, but there's just something about your first ground and something about Main Road being what it was like. Um, so that club, it, like uh, uh, I can make a distinction between City pre Etihad and, and post Etihad. So I I kind of feel like like the club is in a different place in each one of its eras. And I remember a lot of seasons uh, and a lot of incidents in seasons by what kit City were wearing. So. Um, I can I can picture Sean Gota in the in the kind of laser blue um, Kappa kits in the 90, in the late nineties and then moving through to the first advice kit where he scored his, his goals against uh, United in the last derby at Main Road, um, and that feels like an era. And then the Kevin Keegan era feels like an era because of the the, the switch to more light blue again, and then Stuart Pearce for the the kind of light blue with the black dashes. And so I I, I can see all these different eras quite distinctly in my mind's eye. Um, and then you get to 2007, and there's a takeover there by uh, Taxi Sinuatra, who who owned the club for a year, uh, brought in Sven as manager, and that felt like a different era of City. And then the Abu Dhabi ownership feels like a different era of City. But in that, you've got the subsets of kind of Mancini and Guardiola and Pellegrini, all different eras as well. Um, and I guess you don't get that when you're looking from the outside. Um, and I guess a lot of people find it quite easy to look at, at City pre and post takeover and, and, and go, well, that's just two different versions of the same club. Whereas I see probably about 100 different versions of the same club going back from when I started to, to, to now. Um, so it's, I actually find it really difficult to, to kind of differentiate. I understand why people would. And, and listen, let's not pretend that, that the money City have spent since 2008 hasn't had an impact. Uh, because it would be um, it would be very childish of me to come on and say, well, you don't know that City wouldn't have done this anyway, uh, because I think, yes, we probably do. Um, but that's not to say that that we don't enjoy it any more or less or any differently to, to how we all enjoyed it previously. I think there's, um, there, there's a lot of that the, there's that there was a lot of kind of pre takeover enjoyment from city fans that I think a lot of people don't kind of see from the outside because that it's very easy to enjoy the football when you're winning. Um, and a lot of people kind of don't really get that. It's, it's quite easy to, to enjoy the football when you're getting battered by whoever six, one at home. And then suddenly it's, Oh, Oh, oh well, we, we've not, we've nicked a one nil away win at palace. It's great. It's fantastic. This. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I think there's, there's definitely different eras of city. Um, but it feels like it feels like both the same club and a different club. It's like a little bit of a paradox in that in that sense. Um, mm. And I and and it just seems it's just the next stage in in kind of City's development and my life's development and where I am. Because I one of the things I often wonder is, do I miss the old city or do I just miss being younger? Um, and I think it's probably that I just miss being younger and going to the game in the way I did back in 2002 rather than how I go to the game when we're all allowed to now. I think just one, reflecting upon one moment in isolation being August 2008, you're after having the season under Sven Joran Eriksson and Taksin Shenawatra. He ends up in his own state of affairs in Southeast Asia and trying desperately to sell the club. Sheikh Mansour and Abu Dhabi come in and on deadline day, you sign Robinho. Now, the next two weeks after that, not even, I suppose, well, even the most ardent of Manchester City fans and most optimistic of Manchester City fans could not have reasonably have foreseen the success that was about to ensue over the coming decade. But reflecting on one game in particular, being a Chelsea fan, I remember the first game under the Abu Dhabi ownership 
was when Chelsea went up to Eastlands and won 3 1. But Robinho made his debut that day, he scored a free kick. But I'll never forget the sights and the images of Manchester City fans at a packed city of Manchester Stadium with the fake dollar notes and all dressed in Condores and so on and so forth. Were you in the ground that day at all, David? I, I was in the ground. Uh, and it's funny how how about, what is it now, uh, 13 years can make uh, can, can change your perceptions of how things look look good or look bad or look sensitive or insensitive because uh, I, I don't think it's necessarily the, the greatest look that City fans could have had at that time but um, it was it was just a bit of fun really wasn't it um, yeah I, I think it, it's interesting that I think um, I think you're right in that a lot of City fans probably couldn't have seen where this was going to end up on that day um, but I think there's probably a reason you don't expect and that's because uh, even like even if we take my lifetime supporting City, which I'm 33, so it's not it's not exactly the greatest experience that there's there's a lot of City fans out there that have got a lot of more uh, kind of hard yards done. Um, but everything, everything that City fans had experienced up to that point, that everything that I'd experienced up to that point was a false dawn. Um, the Premier League era started, and I think I, I think it was either the season before the Premier League or the season before that. Um, City finished above United. It was early 90s. Uh, they finished fifth, United finished sixth. And both clubs were in a position to build in the same way. Um, obviously, you know, United went on to build one of the greatest dynasties that that we've seen at all time. And City finished the 90s in their lowest ever league position in the in the third tier. Um, so it couldn't have gone very much differently. And so you, like that early 90s period was an opportunity for City to really kick on. And you're thinking, great, this is going to be fantastic. And it turns out, you know, it all turns out bad. Um, mid nineties, there's the um, uh, Peter Swales out campaign, and Francis Lee takes over as chairman. And you're thinking, this is it. We've got somebody in now who's going to invest in the club, and the club just carried on plummeting down the down the table, um, sacking manager after manager, and then uh, Joe Royal arrives and uh, kind of clears out the deadwood, and City win back to back promotions to get back to the Premier League. You're thinking, this is it. And even at the start of that 2000 2001 season. Like we don't like to get carried away, but like like we just signed George Ware, um, the former World Footballer of the Year. Paolo Wanchop had come in. These were exciting players to to come back to the Premier League with, and even Joe Royal was talking about the fact that City might finish in the top six that season, having just been promoted. And so obviously they finished 18th and went down. And so it's like, oh, well, okay, crashing back to earth with a bump. Then Kevin Keegan comes in and, and revolutionises the style of play. We play attacking football like we've never seen before in the in the championship and absolutely stroll to the title that season. And then, you know, final season at Main Road, there's, you know, they're promoted. They get back into Europe, albeit by the Fair Play League, but they finish in the top half of the Premier League. Things are heading in the right direction week, week after week. Um and then they nearly get relegated the next season. And then Kevin Keegan's tenure ends with a bit of a whimper because he can't really get anything more out of the squad. Stuart Pearce comes in and we're thinking, okay, untried manager, but you know, there's an opportunity here. They win something like nine of the last 11 games of that season. And they miss out on Europe because Robbie Fowler misses a penalty on the final day. And that's like, that, that was like, okay, well, next season, we have a chance of qualifying for Europe. So obviously that next season, they finish with 10 defeats in 11 games at the end of the season and plummet towards the, the, the relegation zone. The next year, they score 10 goals at home all season and that's it. Uh, final goal of the, of the season was on New... Final home goal of the season was on New Year's Day. Um, and we're thinking, God, is this, as, is this as good as it gets? And then the takeover happens and Sven-Goran Eriksson's manager, and this is, this is fantastic, we're, by, we're investing money into players. So obviously the owner doesn't have that money and is end, ends up on the run and has human rights uh, issues with, uh, with uh, Amnesty International. And the club is in major doubt of going into liquidation because he can't fund any of the transfers that he said he could. Um, and so all of that, like that, each one of those uh, events is like a domino effect where you then say, of course, City get taken over and become the richest club in the world. Of course, City will spend the money badly. We'll finish this say we'll be in the relegation zone at Christmas, which they were. And we'll just we'll just never get anywhere near what the potential is. And so it's very easy to look back and as an outsider and say this was always going to happen. Um, but I think a lot of City fans will have been just will, will have been just desperate for something to to, to go right for once. Um, and you know, here we are, what twelve years on, and you can't really you can't really say that they, that they've put a foot wrong on in terms of the the, the the playing side of things. They've won trophy after trophy. We've had the, a level of football that we haven't seen in England ever 
uh, at times, uh, especially under Guardiola. And, um, you know, it, it feels like a, an absolute crisis now when they when they drop any points whatsoever. And that, that to a City fan in 2008 would have been madness. Exactly. But for me, would be remiss not to mention self-sabotage in Manchester City in the same sentence. <laughs> and, you know, contrary to many, to what many outsiders believe, David, um, I don't think that self-sabotage ended necessarily when once Abu Dhabi took over in 2008. I believe it probably occurred halfway through their tenure, either side of Mancini and Pellegrini title wins. The inflection point being, in my eyes, the appointment of Ferran Soriano. Because I think when you bring in Soriano and members underneath him, such as Chicky Bergerstein, and of course you have Brian Marwood there who's doing great work. Once you have that organizational structure in place, you have the foundation for everything else to flow from above and within it. And I think without Soriano, there's no way in hell you guys get Guardiola. And of course, you look at the resounding success over the past five years, would be remiss not to mention the title wins of Mancini, of Pellegrini, so on and so forth. But relatively speaking, since Pep Guardiola has taken over in 2016, of course there has been, you know, a small few downs, but largely it's been a roller coaster of ups, so to speak. What, suppose he haven't achieved so much already, Guardiola, where does he go down in city folklore? Um, this is, you'll, you'll get two answers for this, uh, because I think, uh, I think Guardiola is the greatest manager City have had, uh, and that's not just on, on trophies and, uh, and games won. Um, he came in and revolutionized how the team were going to play. He marked his, he, he, it's very easy to look at, at uh, a Guardiola team and say, oh, they play in the Guardiola style. And then you say, well, what is that? Because Barcelona didn't play in the same way that Bayern Munich did and City don't play in the same way as either of those two did. They have the same core principles in that in, in that he wants to get the ball down, play it, play it out from the back and accept the pressure and play through it. But there, he's looked at the team and gone, okay, well, these are the tools that I've got. How am I best going to use them? And for that reason, I think, looking at, at this city side and producing the football that he has, he has to go down as, as, as the greatest city manager. And I'm, I'm not lucky enough to have seen the likes of Joe Mercer and Malcolm Allison at, at city, whereas a lot of, a lot of fans have been, and will tell you that they were the greatest managers that, 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 that city have had just purely because of what they did to bring the team out of the second tier in the sixties and then go on to, to, to win the title. Um, and this is where I get a little bit frustrated with uh, the narrative around Guardiola because it's there's um, there's certain there's certain fans and, and social media kind of amplify, amplifies these fans and I I, I don't necessarily know that, that it, it's a true amplification of how everybody feels um, but you can't avoid it sometimes that uh, the idea that Guardiola can only do what he does because he spends a lot of money and if he gets things wrong then he just spends some more money to cover it up and I'm like well First off, let's not ignore the money that that city have spent under Guardiola because it's it's only fair that they that you judge them in that context because they have spent a lot of money. But the idea that City can go on to win the title with a hundred points in seventeen eighteen and defend that with ninety eight points against an incredible Liverpool side that that pushed them all the way in that season, um, with I mean, for want of a better phrase, any old dickhead at the at the helm, because they've spent a lot of money. Um, it, it just it just doesn't add up because otherwise, Roberto Mancini's title would have been a lot more comfortable than it was. Manuel Pellegrini's title would have been a lot more comfortable than it was, and these these two would have had would have won multiple titles. Um, so clearly, Guardiola's input is is in there, and you don't you don't hear it with with other managers that have had access to those funds. You know, Mancini doesn't get told that he has to go and manage Grimsby to prove himself, yet that's the same thing that you hear of Guardiola all the time. Um, I don't understand why you would look at Guardiola's record and go, um, oh, well, he's only been able to do this because he spent a lot of money, where actually I think that the inverse is probably true. Um, he's only been able to do this because he's a genius and he's had the best tools in the job to be able to do it. He, he He's looked at his squad and gone... Okay, these players are good at this, so I'm going to get them in positions that can that, that they're that they're good at, and it's as simple as that. Um, you know, you, you see City starting lineup for games sometimes, and like take take recent games like uh, like the Fulham game. 
Uh, you see the starting lineup for that, and you know you look at City fans on Twitter, and heads have fallen off all over the place because of, uh, of like, what what is this madman doing? And then they run out for comfortable three 0 winners, and you go, oh, okay, maybe 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 he actually knows what he's doing it. Um, and I just find I find the cynicism around Guardiola quite frustrating at times, and in in many ways that's why I that that's more why I wanted City to win the title again this season, not because I'm a City fan and wanted to see them lift the trophy, um, but because the narrative would have been um, or would be if he doesn't, if, if they collapse from here or whatever, um, the narrative would be, oh, Guardiola's time in England is a failure because he's won two titles out of five so far. Uh, when actually he's raised the bar beyond belief and Liverpool had to respond to that and credit to them, they did. Um, they now have to do what City did last season and reinvent themselves for the next season so that it, it's it, that they're able to keep going in, in, in the same way. And I think Guardiola deserves a lot of credit, first off, for raising the bar, and second off, having to look at his, his side last season and take it apart and put it back together again because that's something he's never done at, at any of his previous clubs. Um, so where he kind of stands in, in City folklore... I have to say that I, I don't. I've never seen a city manager do this sort of thing before, even on the kind of comparative resources. So, like, take Kevin Keegan for instance. I loved Keegan as a city boss. He couldn't reinvent his side, and he he got them playing great football and, and got them up the table. After it went wrong, he couldn't then make it right again. Stuart Pearce never made never made it right again. Joe Royal, I think, would have had a good chance in this in the in the second tier after being relegated. But I, you know, he was never given that opportunity because they had Keegan available. There's never been a city manager that I can remember that has had to take his side apart and put it back together again and has has achieved the same sort of level of success based on kind of where they were previously. And for that, I think Guardiola deserves a lot more credit than he gets. I think the key point there, Dave, being reinvention. For me, the great coaches, the great managers of our time certainly have been the ones that have been able to kind of go away, reinvent themselves, um, and adapt to their new surroundings, which Guardiola has done everywhere between Barcelona, Bayern Munich, and now Manchester City. And it's much easier to, to talk to talk, so to speak, as opposed to walk walk. We've seen it with Mourinho before taking on the Tottenham job. He did that infamous interview with Sky Sports where he's quoting Charles Darwin talking about <laughs> human evolution, so to speak. But you've seen Manchester City this season. They are certainly a different incarnation of a side very different to the team that won in 17, 18, 18, 19, when you had Sané and Sterling on the flanks, David Silva, Kevin De Bruyne playing as two free number eights. But this season, you look at the tail end of last year, losing 3-1 to Leon, beginning of this season, losing 5-2 to Leicester. Those two defeats firmly in Guardiola's mind. Start of the season, you see a more lacklustre, lethargic, turgid, Manchester City as they try to dominate more games just by sheer control, with the Nadir point being 1-1 draw at home to West Brom in December, setting in motion City's 21-game winning run, which has obliterated the record box. What changes have we seen to Guardiola's side since that Wednesday night in December? Um, it's, it, it's interesting because... Um, We've asked him in press conferences what what he's changed and and kind of like what sparked it, and he was quite honest uh, recently in an interview with uh, Rio Ferdinand on on BT about the uh, the that West Brom game where he, he basically said I, I didn't like what I was seeing. Um, I, I I I felt he said I, he said something like I felt we were running too much, and what I kind of took from that was that they were trying to force the issue too much, and like. The, the one thing I will credit Guardiola with this season, I think it was it was around about the time that Liverpool got beaten uh, quite heavily by Aston Villa, um, that he he almost looked at this season and went, we can't, we can't carry on trying to do what we used to do because this season is going to be mad. So what we have to do is just take control of games. And you look at the Manchester Derby at Old Trafford, uh, he went there and... Um, my, my colleague Sam at The Athletic uh, described that game as uh, shit by design. And like he, he went there, kill the game, make sure there are no chances at either end. If, if anybody's going to nick it, it'll be City because they have the, the individual quality to nick it. But let's get out of there with, with nothing happening and it's fine. Um, and then the West Brom game comes along in the midweek and that was just shit. It wasn't like the, the, there was no design in that one. Um, and 
he looked at it and, and went, we, we have to go back to basics. And what made that 17-18 side so good was you had uh, Sane on the wide left, Sterling on the wide right, stretching the entire game. Um, Sane would very much hug that touchline. And so when he got the ball, Sterling would find himself in uh, kind of like coming inside to, to either support Aguero or Jesus and would, would get a lot of um, opportunities at the back post. And so he kind of went, well, I know Raheem Sterling likes playing on the left side, cutting inside. But if we do that, we have to have Riyad Mahrez on the right side, cutting in on his left side. And if the other team are playing a back four or a back five, it's very easy to stand off that and just kind of keep everything contained. And we're just not creating the chances. So for about six, eight weeks, he, he, he flipped back and he, he, he put uh, Phil Foden wide left. He put uh, Sterling wide right and stretched the game. And it didn't, it didn't have an immediate impact because I remember thinking in the uh, the weekend after that West Brom game, they beat Southampton 1-0 at St. Mary's. And I remember thinking they are they are wide open in this game. Southampton had a, had a lot of good chances in that game um, and City got away with it and they got away with the win. But then by the time City got to Stamford Bridge in uh, just after Christmas, they're starting to put a bit of a run together and they're starting to play quite well. That first 20 minutes at Chelsea was was bloody awful. And then Gundogan scores against the runner play, and they remember that they can that that they can play like they used to play. And ever since that moment, the football was great for two, three months or so, up until the last couple of weeks where they've kind of been getting away with it again. Um, where obviously they didn't get away with it in in the Manchester derby. So I think the big change that he made was was just to kind of batten down the hatches and make sure City were hard to beat. I've, I've never seen even. You know, even going back to the Stuart Pearce team that that had to be able to defend because otherwise, because if it didn't, it would lose games. Um, I've never seen a, a, a team defend as well as this City side have. They they are if they're leading with a, a narrow one or one nil or two one lead in the in the final five ten minutes or so, and the opposition get the ball and decide to start pumping it into the box. I'm sat there now watching the City team thinking, yeah, go on, bring it on, keep pumping it into the box because Diaz, Stones and Laporte will just head it away. That's that's how it's been working this season. Um, so I, I think a lot of credit has to be given to Guardiola to look to be able to look at the, the shape of this season, not just at City, but elsewhere, and go, no, the team that wins the league this year is the one that defends well and nicks games, not the one that I had two years ago that blitzes everyone away. Because in you know, if we're playing a full nine-month season in the space of seven months, we ain't going to be able to do that. It's just like the fitness is not going to be there throughout the season. We're going to pick up injuries, players will get COVID. There's no way we can do it. Um, and I think credit where it's due is he, he kind of he made City really really hard to watch in kind of October November time, um, and they reap the reward to that through January February and March they really have. Of course, and I think it's more or less getting back to basics, David, in terms of just you know sheer genius by simplicity. And um, case in point being the five two against Southampton last week, I watched it there myself again last night, and the one thing I noticed was that Southampton were actually decent. They had a yeah. good game plan. But what City did was just open up the pressing trap to Jack Stevens. Southampton had a centre-back playing midfield. And it was Fernandini on the groin who closed him down simultaneously twice. That led to two to City goals. And for me, it was just that kind of ability to dictate the game, not by clear domination by, on City's behalf, but waiting for the opposition to make mistakes and being within that solid structure to take advantage of it. Um, one of the key principles, of course, behind City's resurgence to form and the 21 winning game run has been this incorporation of pausa, something which your colleague Sam at The Athletic has alluded to before, the likes of Ilkay Gundogan, Bernardo Silva, yeah. which they have in abundance. I think you know where I'm going with this question, but Sam put out a fairly controversial article on The Athletic a few weeks ago about our City better without Kevin De Bruyne as opposed to being better with him. What is your own opinion on that? Um, I kind of agree. We, we, we discussed this on uh, the Why Always Us podcast a few weeks ago, and I, I kind of agree with Sam that um, De Bruyne, for me, is... Um, I don't really know the levels that Messi and Ronaldo are at at the moment, but like, I, I feel like he is as close to those two as you can get. Um, so I think it's absolute madness to suggest that City are better without the third best player in the world in the side. Um, but what I what I do think is City are best place out of pretty much any team that I can think of worldwide to lose that player and still be able to cope. Now, 
De Bruyne hasn't played particularly well in the last few few weeks since coming back from injury. He is he's slowly getting his rhythm back and getting back into the side. Um, and I think that's that's kind of showed. He started against West Ham and was was awful, but for putting in a a, a, a great assist over the top for for Diaz to score the opener. Um, he, he couldn't make five five yard passes without giving it away to, to a West Ham player. And that's just a symptom of coming back in from, from injury. I don't, I, I don't subscribe to the wider view of, of the idea that, Oh, it's because, it'll, you know, Gundogan is in the team and he can't play with Gundogan and, or Bernardo needs to be playing here. And that's exactly where De Bruyne wants to play because at the start of this winning run, the, all three of those were in the side and they were playing particularly well. So I think, um, I, I, I don't think City are a better side without De Bruyne. I just think that they're very well placed to cope without him. And what that what that does is it kind of it's it, it, it it's the kind of false equivalence where uh, because it looks good without him, that must mean he's the problem. When actually, because he looks good without him, it's just because City have a better squad than anybody else. Um, they, there is a way to play with with De Bruyne in the side. There is a way to play without De Bruyne in the side. So uh, I, I don't think there's much to it. Um, and I, I certainly. I would trust Guardiola's judgment. If he keeps picking De Bruyne, there's probably a reason. I think I think um I think Guardiola's built up enough credit in the bank for me to be able to go, you know what, I'll give him this one. I'll let him I'll let him make this call on that one. I think the issue there mainly has been, you know, of course, with tactics, players will players will interpret the same <laughs> the same instructions differently. I think that's just a great example with De Bruyne spending time outside the first team. You're bringing back Bernardo into the side, El Gundogan. They interpret the same uh, instructions differently to a team early. Yeah. And, and then, they play and you know they play well and everyone goes, oh well De Bruyne must be the problem. And it's like that that's that's two plus two equals five. That's not that's it's just it's just different solutions to different problems. That's all that's that's all it is. And it's it's part of Guardiola's management where you know I remember in his first season, um we went away to to Barcelona in the Champions League and it was going all right um until well until Claudio Bravo caught the ball outside of his box and got sent off. Um and then ten men against that Barcelona side, you were like you were in trouble. Um, and it was going all right because what what Guardiola had done is he'd not played a striker. He dropped Aguero, and like, kind of like the reaction online again was, "Oh, can you believe that he's taken the best striker ever out of this side when you need to score goals against this Barcelona team?" And the truth was, his solution to the to, to the problem uh, of how do you stop. Um, Messi, Neymar and Suarez wasn't let's try and mark Messi, Neymar and Suarez. It, it was let's make sure the ball doesn't get to them. And to do that, he took his striker out and put another midfielder in and it was working really well apart from, I, I think, Fernandinho slipped in the first half and that uh, that allowed um, Neymar in. Um, and then they were 1-0 down up until Bravo got sent off and then it was just like the floodgates opened. So he looks at the problem and comes up with the solution. It's not necessarily, I need to play my best players. It's, I need to play my best players for this job that I am going to do. And sometimes De Bruyne is part of that, sometimes he's not. And it's not a... It's not a... Um, it's not a slight on De Bruyne to say that I think for this game, it should be Gundogan and, and Bernardo, or for this game, it should be De Bruyne and Gundogan, or for this game, it should be Bernardo and, and, Gun, and uh, De Bruyne. It, it, there's, there's, they have a deep squad for a reason. And I think, I think a lot of people who, who look at, um, who, again, kind of try and answer that problem, uh, it, it, try and answer that question, is, is De Bruyne the problem? Uh, with yes, are generally looking at the at too small a sample size. If you look at the sample size of the season, City have played well with him. They've played well without him. They've played badly with him. They've played badly without him. It just that's how football works. Um, and so yeah, I kind of I kind of agree with Sam on that. It's, as you mentioned there continuously, Dave, it's about finding solutions, and one has been accommodating De Bruyne in a false nine position. Now we've seen concerns over Gabriel Jesus his output, um, Sergio Aguero's future is up in the air. I mean, should Manchester City be looking for an Erling Haaland type figure this summer? Will they be in the market for a centre forward? Um, there's a lot of dominoes that could fall this summer. Um, Aguero is the big one because obviously he's out of contract at, at the end of this season. Um, the word at the moment is that no contract has been offered uh, and that talks haven't even started, which wasn't a problem in January. Um, we're now mid-March and, you know, the, the end of the season is really creeping up. Um, he will have offers from from a lot of the top cl- clubs across Europe because of, of who he is. Um, and Guardiola wants to see that that he can 
and still contribute in the way that that he asks a striker to contribute, and that is uh, that that is a problem for Aguero only because of of the the last kind of year eighteen months he's had. He's had a torrid time with injuries, and he's had he's just he, he's the the big stat at the weekend was was he scored his first goal in fourteen months, that's which ridiculous. Um, it, it sounds ridiculous, but then like when you break that down, that's that's fourteen Premier League appearances, most of which were ten and fifteen minutes at the end of games. That City had already won, so they're not trying to, to 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 force the issue and get another goal. They're just keeping possession, and so when you break it down like that, it, it's actually only seven lots of uh, effectively full ninety minutes that he's played in in between those games, um, and most of those ninety minutes are made up of those 10, 15 minute bursts, and it's it's. So it's very misleading to look at, at how at the time between Aguero's two Premier League goals in that sense. Um, what that what that statistic actually shows uh, isn't that Aguero's output has been um, particularly bad. It's that he's not featured and he hasn't been able to feature because he's had a, a really bad knee injury. Uh, he's had a hamstring injury on top of that. And then he got he caught COVID. Um, uh, I think it was over Christmas. So like he's he's consistently battling this uh this um th- this problem of, of needing game time to get fit and get back into the side but city having a system now that they've had to come up with in his absence because they didn't have a striker that could do the job that he did um so th- there's a very fine balance in that so he might not get the game time that he needs to, to to prove himself in the final few months of the season and so then the club have to make a decision are they going to offer him a contract because he's the best striker that they've ever had and you want to give him one last chance to to kind of prove himself or do they make the cold hard decision of listen this kid Erling Haaland at, at Dortmund is doing a real real good job there's not many clubs who can afford him this summer his, his buyout clause doesn't kick into effect next summer let's get this deal done and they've got a little bit of leverage as well with um with they they have a sell-on clause for Jaden Sancho as well so they, they have leverage there to be able to negotiate a little bit with you know well how about what what would it do for the Haaland deal if we were to say okay you can you can keep all the money that you get from from Sancho um so that's an interesting um dynamic there's also the the dynamic that um Messi's contract is out of uh, is up at the end of the season with Laporta winning the Barcelona elections it's looking less likely he'll he'll leave but you never know he, he might make his decision that he wants to leave Barcelona and, and move somewhere else if he does sit he'll be bang banging on that door with a contract offer again um and then you've also got the, the aspect that Haaland can pretty much choose where he wants to go next because as long as the club can afford him, um, like everybody wants him. If, you know, if if he wants to go to Chelsea, I'm sure Chelsea will stump up the money for him. You know what I mean? So like they have that dynamic to to kind of contend with. It's not it's not a nailed on pro, uh, proposition. If they want Haaland, that they're going to get him. They 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 have to they have to be able to prepare for that. Um, and then you also have the dynamic that if Haaland doesn't choose City, uh, one of their rivals is going to get a really good centre forward, and yeah. then City are left with, with in a position where they might not want to be. So there's there's kind of it, it's a real kind of waiting game at the moment to find out who blinks first, sort of thing. Um, my my gut instinct is that they're going to want to like even if Aguero doesn't leave this summer, they're going to want to replace him because. Um, with the greatest of respect to Jesus, he's he's really good at what he does, but what he does is not what Sergio Aguero does. He's much better pressing the opposition and coming in from the left than being that focal point of the of the attack. He's just not he doesn't provide enough of a goal threat to be that that kind of uh, Aguero figure. Uh, what he does do is force goals and force chances by tirelessly running from or, or tirelessly holding his position and knowing where he needs to press and how he needs to run and where he needs to move to be an option for his teammates. Uh, it just particularly isn't clinical, clinical enough. Um, uh, and and that that is what I think City will want to replace. So my gut instinct, it's a long-winded answer and I've repeated myself about a hundred times. <laughs> um, but my gut instinct for this summer is that um, whether or not Aguero goes, City will be hell bent on trying to bring in uh, his replacement, even if it's that they play together next season and then Aguero leaves, or if Aguero decides, listen, I'm 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 done here, my contract's up, I'm going somewhere else, um, then they'll they'll have his replacement ready, ready and waiting there to go. Um, I don't see a situation where City don't spend money on a striker this summer. I just don't. I, I think if they do that, um, they are taking a massive gamble going into next season. And I think one thing. 
yourself, David, or many Manchester City fans won't like to hear is that Pep Guardiola is a lot similar to Sir Alex Ferguson in the case of making unemotional, objective, cold-hearted decisions, whatever you may call them. And it's been that kind of... He's been vindicated by his decisions in the past just by ruthless objectivity when he's come into these decisions. And we've seen it in his ability to redevelop squads, re-innovate at Bayern, re-innovate at Manchester City. He doesn't suffer fools gladly. We've seen it in the past with Ronaldinho, Zlatan Ibrahimovic, Leroy Sané, and most recently Raheem Sterling, who's been frozen out over the last two games. Is Sterling walking on thin ice, so to speak, at the moment? It's it's difficult to, to know um, because... Um, the situation was still in slightly different than it was with, with Sane. Um, with Sane, Guardiola quite regularly would kind of call him out in press conferences. So he would, uh, he, he, you know, he'd get asked the question, oh, Leroy Sane was good today, wasn't he? And uh, he would he would reply with something like, uh, yeah, but he needs to do this, 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 and he needs to move here and, and do that. If it, you know, he, he could be one of the best players. And then the week after, you'd say, well, that thing you were saying about Sane, uh, you left him out this week. What, like, what were the reasons behind that? And his response would be infuriatingly along the lines of, no, Sane is one of the best players in the squad. Uh, it was just rotation. There's not like, and so it's, it's really hard to say. Um, history tells us that, um, th- that Guardiola will always do what he thinks is best for the team as a whole. Um, and but also that he wants players there that want to be part of the squad, um, which was a little bit surprising in the transfer market, for instance, why they went back for, for Laporte because Laporte had turned City down in 2016. Um, and kind of my understanding of, of, of how things were working at City at the time was, well, if you say no to us, that's it, it's over. We're not, we're not kind of coming back for you. If you you've, it's fine for you to say no, but that's it, that's your chance and that, that's it, gone. And then they go back for Laporte, you know, 18 months later. And uh, I, I assume that's because Southampton told them uh, where to go with their offer of, uh, for Van Dijk. Um, but it, it's funny how it works. So uh, it's two games. There's Sterling was, was obviously left out of the uh, Southampton game and they're not involved at all against Fulham. Uh, he's done it with other players in the past. Mares has been uh, has been one where um, he was left out of the squad and then uh, and and then kind of left out entirely or not even on the bench the following weekend because he'd complained about it. Um, and I don't see it as a as, as a huge issue. Um, the one thing I, I do wonder is, you know, there's been something there's been something a little bit up with Sterling this season. His form hasn't been quite what it was, and that's it's it's quite harsh to to kind of go in on him for that because his form has been sensational for three years, um, but he's not been playing to the level that he'd set himself earlier in this season. And whether that's fatigue, whether it's it's simply because of of, of how City have been playing, it could be a side effect of of the fact that Guardiola himself made the team really boring for 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 kind of four or five months or so. Um, so it's been it's been a difficult one for him this season, um, and I can understand the frustration of him being left out and and seeing Guardiola about it. And I can also understand Guardiola going right. I'm not having that. I heard Mick McCarthy talking about uh, Jay Bothroyd on uh, Sky Sports recently, where uh, he'd said uh, he, he brought Jay Bothroyd on. Um, he'd scored the equaliser for Wolves and then had celebrated in a way to say, "Look, you should have started me." And so the first thing he did was sub him off and. Like it's like I, I totally get it. I, I get the, the element of respect there. Um and I understand like Sterling being not not happy with being in the side. And Guardiola himself said it in the pre-match press conference for, for Munch and Gladbach. You know, he doesn't want players who are happy to sit and twiddle their thumbs when they've been left out. He likes that players are, are, are not happy when they've been left out. Um but there is also a way to say, look, I'm not happy about being left out. And if what's if there has been a, a confrontation. Um, I think it's it's probably healthy for Guardiola to give give Sterling some time to cool down, sort of thing. Um, so I'm not overly worried about the situation. I don't think it's it's. I don't think we're, we're looking at the beginning of the end of their relationship, sort of thing. Um, it was it was a slow burner with 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 him and Sane. I don't think there's a lot of a lot of comparisons there um, because I think I think Sterling is is very aware of what Guardiola has has helped him with as as a player, and I think Guardiola was very aware of what Sterling has brought to to, to City. So. Um, I'd be surprised if, if this was if this was anything more than than a little kind of slap on the wrist. Exactly. And we've begun this podcast, David, by speaking about the dreaded 
quadruple talk. We're going <laughs> to not necessarily speak about the quadruple, but perhaps the Champions League. If City are to achieve continental aspirations this season, what do you want to see from them? What obstacles will they have to overcome? How different does the how does the City team need to evolve compared to the one we've seen get knocked out by Leon last season? Which have although they've gone on a twenty one winning game winning run in the past few months, we've seen in the big games, perhaps most recently against Manchester United, you know, if you sit off City, there's space in behind to break. If you have players in wide positions, how do City secure that first and that maiden European Cup? I, this is a question that I struggle with because um, Guardiola himself keeps saying that he doesn't think City are ready to win it. And my my answer to that all the time is, well, like if not now, then when? Because like they have the best team in Europe. They they just do, and yet they come up against Leon or Liverpool or, or Tottenham, and something mad happens. And I I wonder if it's a side effect of um, of high risk football, basically. Uh, high risk football wins enough games in a in a league season to be able to kind of cope with the odd shock defeat uh, but in a cup competition it gets you knocked out because you obviously you lose a game and that's it it's over um the problem that i have with my own theory on that is that they keep winning the league cup they keep winning the fa cup so like they there must be a good cup side in there somewhere um and yet you know i mean even go back to to that that first season under monaco um that game was incredible at the Etihad. Um, they had the opportunity to go in and put Monaco to the sword a little bit more. They made it 5-2, 5-3 with about five, six minutes to go. And Monaco were dead on their feet. And Guardiola took a striker off and brought a holding midfielder on and said, that's it, we're, we're taking the 5-3. And I looked at that and thought, this isn't going to be enough. They're going to they're gonna go into the away leg and they're going to concede goals in this game. So while Monaco are dead and buried we should be trying to make it 6-3 and 7-3 and see if you can just bump that scoreline up a bit. Uh, and then, of course, they go out on the away goals rule in uh, in Monaco and and, and lose, uh, lose 3-1. Um, the next year, Liverpool happens and there's a whole incident with the bus. And then that year, it was uh, kind of, oh, woe is us because um, Liverpool's first goal was offside and then uh, City should have had a goal that were, that were perfectly good goal that, that, that didn't stand because it was uh, incorrectly flagged offside. Uh, they should have had a penalty that wasn't given and it's kind of like, oh, this this officiating can't wait till VAR comes in to sort all this out. And then VAR comes in and they get knocked out of, uh, of the Champions League against Spurs because the, the equaliser that they score is in fact offside by a, by a hair's breadth. And uh, in in the season before, when that would have stood, the season after, when they're going, yes, we need VAR to help us out and get the correct decisions, they then don't benefit from it. Um, so it's kind of one thing after another. And then the Leon thing, um, Leon last season was was much more in keeping with how City were playing last season than than any of the other defeats. I think uh, I think the the defeat to Liverpool and the defeat to uh, Tottenham, uh, especially, were bigger problems than the defeat to Leon. Even though Leon, even though it looks like a massive upset against Leon, City's problem last season was they would go three or four games blitzing aside, and then they would throw in a game where they could play and play and play all night and and just never score. Um, and it just followed the pattern. That's what happened. Uh, they played Leon. They had all the ball. They just could not find the net. And you know, when when you've got players missing open goals from from three yards, you're kind of saying, well, like, what more can the manager do to get anything out of this side? They've just got to score those chances. Um, so so this season, um, I don't know. Maybe maybe the fact that it's been played mostly behind closed doors will will help them because it's kind of like laboratory conditions now. It's 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 there's no real home and away advantage. It's just who is the better side of, of these players, and there's no kind of emotional attachment to it all. Maybe that will help them. I don't know. Um, what City have to do to win the Champions League? They, they need to get lucky. They've just they they, they haven't had any luck whatsoever, um, and they felt far far too happy to blame the bad luck. Uh, so what they need to do is is either overcome the bad luck or get lucky. <laughs> it's not. I think it's quite a simple solution, really. I think if UEFA were to 
<laughs> rebrand the Champions League or perhaps put a big Carabao sticker on the yeah yeah get it sponsored by Carabao that's 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 the one uh, the, the Carabao the, the the one the, the only reason I really hope City win this season's Carabao Cup final is because uh, the sponsorship I think changes next season uh, and so it will make City the only ever winners of the Carabao Cup so uh, yeah it's if, if, if Carabao could come in for the for, for two wafer and just drop them a lot of cash to sponsor the tournament I'm sure City had. Uh, <laughs> Lift it year after year, yeah. What's it? Uh, they're going for the fourth Carabao Cup in a row? Yeah, yeah, fourth Carabao Cup in a row. Uh, and I think the sponsorship changes next year. So uh, if they if it does, then um, no other side would have won the Carabao Cup. I think there's a book there to be published, David. <laughs> I'm not doing that one. <laughs> <laughs> and I suppose, finally, to close, David, um, how, how long does this Guardiola dynasty last? Um... It lasts as long as he wants it. Um, I I don't think City will ever sack him. There's no reason for them to. Um, I I don't think they. I I, I think they spent so long building this club to get into a position to get him at, at the Etihad. Um, yeah, I don't I don't see a, I don't see a situation where City end it voluntarily. I think I think he has to walk away, um, and. I was a bit surprised when he signed his contract extension. I thought he'd finish at the end of uh, at the end of this season, um, but he obviously saw something that that he wanted to be able to develop. Um, and I, I also wonder if he sees that he's not going to get it better elsewhere because he's got a lot of control that he wouldn't get at other clubs. Um, you know, he didn't have that level of control at Bayern Munich. He didn't even have that level of control at, at Barcelona, where he had a lot of control. Um, Guardiola's word at City is gospel. So as long as as long as he is happy to be there. Uh, City are happy to have him, and that that could mean that at the end of this extension, he's decided that's enough. He might sign another two years. He might sign another three years. He might stay here for fifteen years um, and and kind of keep reinventing the side. Whatever happens, uh, he leaves on his terms, and I think that's that's been clear from from how City have uh, have approached it. And I also think that it's that I, I from a fan's point of view, that's that, that for me is absolutely right. I don't think. Um, I, I think if, if he feels that he can change things and make things better and they're not going well, uh, I think he deserves the opportunity to do it. And, you know, I, I, he's never going to oversee a City side that gets relegated. He's never going to see a, oversee a City side that is in a disastrous position. Um, I think he himself would uh, would probably accept that things aren't going right and, and, and decide to, to kind of move on at that point anyway. Um so there's there's no real risk from City to to kind of keep allowing him to to stay for as long as he wants, and listen, they've got the best manager in the world. So why wouldn't you want to keep keep extending that contract until he says no, I've had enough. Sorry, I want to want to go and put my feet up somewhere hot instead of sitting in uh, in Brighton in the in the pouring rain. Awesome, it's been absolutely brilliant, nonetheless. Anyways, David, to get terrific insight into Guardiola's work indeed at Manchester City and hear about the Kevin Keegan years and everything before. I could talk. I could talk about Kevin Keegan for for about an hour. So if you ever want to do that, I'm happy for that. One. <laughs> I think if we bring on Keegan, we'll have to talk about Mike Bassett and uh, <laughs> other famous English managers of the past. But um, David, absolute pleasure again speaking with you. Where's best? To no, connect? thank you very much. Where's best to connect on social media? Uh, I'm on. I, I'm not a very imaginative person, so I'm just at David Mooney on Twitter, um, and uh, Blue Moon Podcast is just at Blue Moon Podcast as well. Uh, that's in all the usual places. So just get, whack it in Google, and you'll find it. Fantastic, awesome speaking to you, David. Anyways, we'll have to get you on again to speak about Kevin Keegan and the. Uh, yes, let's do it. <laughs> Take care. Great having you on. Cheers, Connor. Thank you very much. <laughs>